I stand in awe of the Tuskegee Airmen. He went into service when the war started and became a pilot at Tuskegee. And I said, I want to do that. Tuskegee Airmen are black pilots, mechanics, and support people who, when our country declared war against Hitler, came forward and uh, dispelled the biases and generalizations that because of the color of our skin, we couldn't support our country in a technical area. There was no question that if they were asked, they, they would do. They excelled in almost any area of combat that you can think of. I was, I was in awe because I had to try harder uh, because of the guys uh, like Walt had two years in college. I couldn't spell college. For young folks, I give them four Ps. Perceive, you know, dream your dreams, but find your talents. Prepare, get a good education around and develop the talents that you have. Perform. Let excellence be your goal in whatever and everything you do, always doing your best. And finally, persevere. Don't let the circumstances be an excuse for not achieving. We could have very easily, oh, they don't like me, they don't want me, and gone off in the corner with their head bowed. That's not what the American way. Congratulations on the outstanding performance of your fighters on January 27th, 44. Please express to your pilots my great admiration for their aggressive fighting spirit. I also wish to commend your ground crews for their great devotion to duty, which made the splendid achievement possible. Signed by Paul. The journal. Yeah. History is replete with stories which introduce us to ordinary people who, when called upon, performed in an extraordinary manner. Perhaps nowhere is that more revealing than in the background, exploits, and lineage of the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. Uh, yesterday I fulfilled one of my ambitions as a combat pilot. I got one airplane. On the last mission, in which I got a probable, I was quite pleased in that the airplane didn't go down. Yesterday I was quite surprised and quite pleased to see him go down. Uh, it was the second combat mission I've been on in which I've seen an airplane and had a chance to shoot at one. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is there were almost 16,000 people that participated in the Tuskegee experience. So Tuskegee Airmen is a broad term that includes all of the support personnel. There were men, there were women, there were pilots, there were doctors, there were lawyers, there were every function in the military was embodied in that group. And it is under the umbrella term Tuskegee Airmen. At the time, they, they were probably giants amongst men. Uh, because they were there for a community that didn't have heroes to look up to. I was able to escort an original Tuskegee Airman. His name is Hiram E. Little, and he was out of Georgia. I was stationed at Warner Robins, and I was a young lieutenant. And to listen to him talk about it and to tell me that that uniform that you wear, there are so many people that have sacrificed and lost their lives and paved the way for this to happen and to not take that lightly. And so I felt like he was part of the village that has raised me as a service member and now as a veteran. Uh, the things that he instilled in me that day carried me forward for the rest of my career. The decision was made by Franklin Roosevelt. It was a campaign promise he made in the 1940 election. Franklin Roosevelt was the first Democrat in the history of politics in America to get the black vote. The black vote from the time of Abraham Lincoln on had been solidly Republican. And he said, if elected, I will create a black flying organization. He was reelected and he created the Tuskegee Airmen. At the time, Tuskegee Institute was one of several black colleges previously awarded a government civilian pilot training program contract. 
Although the War Department assumed that war was inevitable, there was a huge shortage of military pilots. To alleviate this, colleges and universities across the country were contracted to provide initial flight training to promising male students who could quickly be trained as military pilots if war should come. Before World War II began, uh, the uh, United States uh, began a civilian pilot training program. Blacks were integrated in only one of these institutions all, all over the United States. 100,000 pilots were trained. Leveraging the fact that it already had a pilot training program in place, Tuskegee President Dr. Frederick Patterson successfully lobbied the War Department to base training of black pilots at Tuskegee, citing an already existing airfield and a successful program. As a result, pilots attended their initial or primary training at Moton Field before transitioning to Tuskegee Army Airfield for more advanced trainer and combat aircraft. While these accomplishments could easily be considered milestones that would signal brighter futures, there was a systemic belief that such an experiment would fail miserably based on the so-called findings published in a 1925 memorandum by the Army War College entitled The Use of Negro Manpower in War. It was prompted by the fact that uh, although blacks made up uh, roughly nine or so percent of the population, uh, during the uh, war they produced only two of, uh, of the divisions. So in other words, the black population was not used uh, in the percentage it should be used. And uh, this made no sense because in the Civil War and in the post-Civil War period, uh, the uh, black units had fought with great distinction. The really segregation in the service came from a 1925 War College study. They felt that the Negro was a subspecies of the human race and not qualified to do anything technical. Because of physical qualification, I could dig ditches, build roads, drive trucks, cook food, till, but any service work. But anything technical? No way. They forwarded this study to the War Department saying, they recommending it become part of a mobilization policy. War Department bought that. So war was declared against Hitler in Europe and the war buildup began. Uh, blacks were excluded in any technical as aspect of, of, of the activity. They knew it was a lie because it was the Army War College that they should have had knowledge of how blacks performed in World War I. The 369th Infantry was assigned to French commanders, and they spent more time on the front line in the trenches than any unit during the war. 369th fought on the line of fire for 191 days. Not a man ever captured, not a foot of ground ever lost. The first American troops to receive the Croix de Guerre, the 369th, and for action above and beyond the call of duty, many received honored medal. Uh, it also said that uh, blacks were inherently cowardly and uh, and the people who did this had the record of the medals of honor that were earned during the Civil War and the 20 medals of honor that were earned in the post-Civil War period. But that made no difference uh, to what they were saying. Now in 1917 we had an African-American named Eugene Bullard. He was a fighter pilot flying for the French in World War I, 1917. Now, certainly the Army War College knew of this. We also should have known that in 1922, a lady named Bessie Coleman from Texas went to France and learned how to fly and came back to this country and she was giving uh, flying demonstrations and encouraging other blacks to get involved in aviation. Well, surely the Army War College knew about that. So why are they putting out all these lies about the ability of black folks when the other example is what black folks can do, give an opportunity. Like so much of the nation, 1940 found a United States military dominated by segregationist policies supported by 1880s Jim Crow laws which prevented black people from entering public places such as libraries, restaurants, and movie theaters unless expressly designated for their use. It was an oppressive system designed to ensure complete separation, exclusion, 
and ultimately humiliation. And it was all legal. I can remember as a young man going up to Atlanta, Georgia from Tuskegee, and we very politely stepped off the curve to let a white couple go by and get back on the sidewalk and so forth. This fellow tapped me on the shoulder and said, get up, move down the back of the bus. I looked up, I said, beg your pardon? He said, I said, get up, move down the back of the bus, it's a scrawny white guy. I laughed at him, you know, I thought he was kidding. Well, I said, you had to go in the back door. On the buses, you had to get in the back, go in the front, go sit in the back. Certain places you couldn't go, couldn't go in the restaurant to eat. You want a bowl of chili, you had to go to the back door and get it, you know. But that's the way life was then. That, we didn't let that stop us from living. We went on. But it's rough. We survived. The Tuskegee Airmen who came from the North uh, to be trained in Alabama uh, were overwhelmed by the depth of the hatred uh, in uh, Tuskegee and in Alabama in general. Uh, the uh, sheriff of uh, Tuskegee, Alabama was extremely hostile uh, to, the, uh, to the Tuskegee Airmen and uh, did everything he could to ruin uh, the reputation uh, of the organization. Uh, living in Tuskegee was not easy. It was threatening. Uh, that's something that white people just don't understand, that, that, that every breath comes under a threatening situation. Tuskegee, Alabama was threatening. Here for the first time, Negro aviation cadets were being groomed to fly war planes of a unit, which was then a unit in Fort Ormond, the 99th Pursuit Squadron. Even in the midst of such a hostile and threatening environment, the dreams these young men harbored within them were so very powerful that they simply could not be deterred. Well, when I was in the sixth grade, I had a love affair with an airplane. And those were during the days when a little putt-putt and everybody would look up at it. It was that new. So I told my mother I was gonna become a pilot. And she just kind of looked at me. Boy, get on that piano stool. Yes, ma'am. The only thing that a black young man could do was become a professor. I didn't want to do any of those things. I did want to be a pilot. No, I know. I had to be a military pilot, a fighter pilot. And that's what I wanted. While blacks had served in the armed forces previously, the most recent occasion being World War I, they were restricted in the types of jobs and positions they could hold. 100% of the stewards, stewards, people who served and cooked were black, 100%. Not virtually 100%, 100%. A very small yet significant step towards change took place on April 3rd, 1939 when President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Public Law 18, which mandated that the Army Air Corps expand its civilian pilot training program, which would prepare black people for service in a variety of areas within the Army Air Corps. Roosevelt passed executive orders and, uh, and there were public laws that called for equal opportunity under a segregated environment. The program for training an all-black flying unit took place at the historic Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. Having been founded by Booker T. Washington in 1881, the Institute already had a strong civilian pilot training program headed by Charles Alfred Anderson, considered by many to be the father of black aviation. He and Eleanor Roosevelt started every black pilot, and I say that to every black commercial pilot that I see. I remind them how you got to be where you are. Oh my God, I would call him the father of all, of the whole program and everything that happened. Uh, he had so much influence over it and uh, uh, highly respected by everyone. Uh, if anyone was looked upon could walk on water, it would be Chief Anderson. Possessed with a passion to fly at an extremely early age, 
yet prevented from accessing traditional methods of learning to fly because of segregation. Charles Anderson would purchase his own aircraft before he was even capable of piloting the aircraft. I couldn't find anyone who would uh, give me any further lessons. I decided that the only way I was going to fly was going to have to get myself an airplane. So eventually I got the money to buy this monocoup. I got the monocoup, still couldn't find anybody to teach me flying back. Charles Anderson would prove to be a pioneer in the field of black aviation, along with his longtime flying partner, Dr. Albert E. Forsyth, whom he credits with contributing just as much to the advancement of black aviation as he himself did. And he was inspired to make these trips and to advance aviation among colored people, which he did a marvelous job. As a matter of fact, I say he's one of the followers of black aviation. Definitely, without a doubt. Possessed with an extreme desire to fly that even he didn't understand, Charles Anderson consistently sought ways in which to find himself skyward in search of the next adventure. Yeah, and a great desire. As a matter of fact, that was number, my, number one desire. That's just about all I could think of. And it, uh, it was something in, my, in me that uh, said this to me that, oh, this is something you must do. And what that motivation, where that motivation came from, I do not know. It was that unexplained fascination and unfettered determination that would eventually lead to Charles Anderson becoming the head instructor at Tuskegee Institute. That decision proved to be a very fateful one a few years later when a very distinguished visitor decided to call upon Tuskegee Institute. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you tonight at a very serious moment in our history. First thing she said when I was introduced to her was that I always heard that colored people couldn't fly airplanes. But I see you flying all around here. I said, oh yes, Mrs. Roosevelt, we've been flying for quite a while. So then she decided she's going to take a ride with me. I don't know if I asked her to or not. Not content to simply watch the flying acrobatics from the ground, Mrs. Roosevelt insisted upon taking a ride in an airplane with a black pilot at the controls. So when it came down, she said, well, see, you can fly all right. Given the racial and political climate at the time, there were many who were not anxious to see such a program become successful. This was a point of contention which has led to differing opinions in regards to the lingering statement that, quote, the Tuskegee experience was designed to fail, unquote. They didn't think it would succeed, but I don't think I would say it was designed to fail because uh, apparently the uh, instructors we had taught guys to fly. During this particular time, there were so many who wanted to see that program fail. This program I'm speaking of is called the Tuskegee Experience. There was a war going on, and the President of the United States, the last time he read the Constitution, said he was Commander-in-Chief, and the Commander-in-Chief ordered an entry point uh, for blacks to be able to fly. That's enough. Commander-in-Chief does that, that's enough. There has been people in the Army who did not want to see this thing succeed. Positively, without a doubt, they didn't want to see it succeed. It was designed to fail, without a doubt, without a question. Just one obstacle over another, just another hoop that we had to jump through. Uh, we were under a quota system. They were only going to train for X number of them, and that was it. So instead of students being washed out because they were incompetent or unable, they were taking good pilots and washing them out just to meet a number, a quota. I'm gonna say this again. The Commander-in-Chief wanted a black flying organization and General George Marshall, Chief of Staff, and you didn't mess with George Marshall. And when Benjamin Davis Jr. got the 99th overseas uh, and the white command structure tried to get rid of it because it was black, not because it had any difficulty, because it was black, it was Marshall that stopped it. Uh, Davis got to defend it in front of the McCloy Commission, committee. Uh, but it was Marshall's order that said, that's enough. 
Uh, we have not given this organization an opportunity to prove itself. That's enough. He took me in a room and he says, we're having a meeting, but no one knows that we're having a meeting. I said, what are you talking about? He says, Harold, 10 of your classmates are going to be washed out. At that time, we had 40 of us in the class. He said, 10 of them are going to be washed out. He said, you come down here with your flight suit pressed, not a speck of dirt on your shoes. You be just as sharp as you can be. Don't give anyone a reason to say, let's go for a check ride. And that proved out to be precisely what happened. Ten guys washed out, and once they say check ride, you aren't going to win the check ride. You're going to get a pink slip. Nobody would ever admit that it was designed to fail. But when you look at some of the data points that were a part of the experience, you can say that there's no way that the pilots were meant to fly. And, and I'll focus directly on the pilots. There's no way that they were meant to fly. First of all, they went to, they went to class. They showed up in Tuskegee and had to retest. Was that normal? A lot of people say that wasn't normal. Once you test at your, once you test it once and you were qualified to go enter pilot training, that's exactly what you did. Once a pilot during World War II finished their training, within a month, they were deployed. Tuskegee Airmen, their first class graduated in about 14 months after they graduated, they finally deployed. So the data point to where I understand it, that's not normal. So was it destined to fail? There's enough that if they wanted to quit, they could have quit. Regardless of the differing opinions, fate would once again find favor among the aviation cadets of Tuskegee as they discovered an ally in the most unlikely of circumstances. The highest award the Tuskegee Airmen give is in the name of Noel Parrish. Were it not for Noel Parrish, the Tuskegee Airmen would not have succeeded at Tuskegee. He did everything to ingratiate himself with black people, and black people appreciated his attitude and appreciated his personality and his performance of duty. They still do. And we give him credit for setting up the conditions at Tuskegee where 992 men were able to go through the flight program and become Army pilots. We had some good friends who were white, like Colonel Parrish, when he came in, it, it changed the whole attitude, I think, at Tuskegee because he, he was for us. You have people who may be your leaders, but they, they're still segregationists, and that's a problem, say. But Colonel Parrish came in and he changed things. And I will say this, that our instructors, I say that the instructors at Tuskegee, all those, some of them were for segregation, what not. As an instructors, I think they did a good job. They were conscientious and uh, did a good job in teaching us to fly. In spite of the success of the aviation school in graduating combat fighter pilots, getting them into the actual theater of war proved to be a much harder task, as the War Department seemed to have no immediate plans to assign combat missions to the now fully operational 99th Fighter Squadron. That's an interesting story. The 99th was delayed getting into combat uh, for nearly a year after they had completed its training. No. Air Force organization was eager to have the Tuskegee Airmen join it. It was a single squadron. It would have to be joined to another squadron. Despite this seemingly insurmountable obstacle, Parrish persisted in his efforts to have the newly formed organization become a participant in the war effort. There was a good deal of prejudice uh, in the United States Army Air Forces, and Parrish uh, overcame that. He made endless flights back to Washington to say, What's going on? They're trained, they should go into combat. Uh, he was their biggest cheerleader, he was their most important trainer. And we didn't have enough aircraft to keep all these pilots who were trained and ready for combat but had no place to go. Until the, when the entire unit was filled, 
They would have to be sent somewhere, of course. It'd be ridiculous for war going on not to use a trained unit. And yet, I could get no indication from Washington, from anybody in the Air Force, that there was a plan as to what to do with them. Displaying remarkable resolve and a steadfast determination which belied his rank, then Colonel Parrish went straight to the top in search of answers for why a fully trained combat unit was still sitting at Tuskegee for a full year in the middle of a war. Parrish's visit to the top came in the person of then Deputy Secretary of Defense, Robert A. Lovett. It was time. Things were getting in uh, a real, uh, there would be trouble over it. So I took it on myself to walk upstairs and uh, just walk in to see Secretary Lovett. Finally, the War Department relented, and in April 1943, the 99th Pursuit Squadron deployed from Tuskegee, Alabama to North Africa, becoming the first all-black flying unit to participate in combat operations. Who was stop our 